In this video, I'm going to cover the six reasons why you need your pet to survive a catastrophe with you, why the so-called expert's advice on pet prepping falls short, what I say you need to do in order to prepare for your pets at a beginner, intermediate, and even advanced survive doomsday level preparedness, and lastly, what if, perish the thought, you have to leave your pet behind in some type of natural disaster. What this video will not cover is pet prepping for things like geckos, parrots, therapy pigs, that sort of thing. What happens when the grid goes down for good? I can't bear the thought. Which brings me to the first reason why you need your pets to survive a crisis with you, emotional support. In times of crisis, stress and anxiety levels can skyrocket. Pets known for their ability to provide emotional comfort can be invaluable in maintaining mental well-being after SHTF. This is especially true for individuals who live alone or are separated from family members and children. Another reason is alerting you to danger. Dogs have keen senses and they can pick up on dangers that humans cannot. They can alert their owners to the presence of intruders, zombies, other animals, or environmental dangers like fires or gas leaks long before humans become aware of them. This early warning system can be life-saving in post-collapse scenarios. Hunting assistance would be another reason. Many dogs and even some cats can be hunting partners. Dogs can be trained to assist in hunting small game while cats can help control rodent populations, which can be crucial in maintaining a sanitary and disease-free environment. Mice and rats can be a major concern in situations where traditional pest control methods are unavailable. Security and protection, dogs also offer that. Their presence can deter intruders and they can defend their owners in dangerous situations. Training a dog for protection can be an added advantage in ensuring safety. Thermal comfort is another reason dogs, particularly larger dogs, can provide some warmth in sleeping environments when heat is otherwise unavailable. And there's also food. You know, in a worst case situation, your last meal could be your pet. <laughs> you want to become the barbecue that you love to eat? Now, if you Google how to prep for pets, you're going to get results from the so-called expert sites like the Red Cross, the Food and Drug Administration, etc. The unfortunate thing here is that they have not joined the Survive Doomsday tribe. They haven't subscribed to the channel like you have. They haven't joined the email list like you have. And these sites aren't offering advice for a long-term collapse. It's frankly just sad. Take, for example, the advice from the Red Cross. If it's not safe for you to stay in your home during an emergency, it's not safe for them either. No shit. The FDA site isn't much better, but they suggest stocking a week's worth of food and water for your pet. One week? What are these pet owners doing if they don't have at least one week's worth of pet food already? Are they door dashing the dog's dinner? These sites only offer silly survival advice. Our pets, they deserve much better than this. We're advanced preppers, and fortunately for our furry friends, we're going to account for them in our personal preparedness plans. I'm going to break down pet preparedness into three levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. At the beginner level, you're essentially following the advice of those sites that I just mentioned. You want to make sure you've accounted for everything at this stage because you're going to build on top of this level at intermediate and advanced. And since short-term preps account for more common crises, it's logical to start here rather than end-of-the-world scenarios, which we'll get to in a moment. Microchipping and identification. You probably already have a dog collar or a cat collar around your pet with your contact information on there. Make sure it's clear to see as they wear over time and that you have more than one phone number on there. In a crisis, it's not uncommon for pets to go missing. Assuming your pet can survive on its own for a while, and odds are it can, this is the easiest and cheapest way to assure your pet gets back to you. Fewer people get their pets microchipped, but this isn't uncommon either. A veterinarian can do that. They put a microchip just under the skin of your pet with a needle that's just a little bit bigger than a typical vaccine needle. Not everyone does this. Some people do. If it's something you choose to do, make sure that you keep your contact information up to date on that chip. Now, the obvious advantage to a microchip over a collar with an ID there is the microchip is more permanent. And in some cases, the chip might actually be safer particularly in a situation like a natural disaster. The collar can get caught on something, food and water. The most important thing here is making sure you have at least two weeks worth of pet food stocked for your pet. 
Think of it like stocking your pantry. Rotate stock with foods that you already eat today. And as for water, you really just need to make sure that you've accounted for your pets in your water preparedness plan. If you need help with that, see my video on how much water to store. Medication and first aid supplies. When it comes to medication, if your pet is on any regular life-saving medications, make sure to have a conversation with your veterinarian about getting some extra on hand. They should be open to this so long as it's a not a controlled substance of some type. Now on first aid supplies, you want to account for your pet's health needs in your first aid kit, or you can build a pet specific first aid kit. All things being equal, I recommend the latter just because you're building another layer of redundancy. So here are some items you probably want to consider putting in that pet first aid kit. Antibiotic ointment, bandage tape and scissors, cotton bandage rolls, flea and tick prevention, alcohol pads, latex gloves, saline solution, towel and washcloth, gauze, antiseptic wipe, proper fitting muzzle. No need to try and write all of that down. If you want to get the list, follow the link in the description that'll take you to my course spending article on my website. Everything's right there. Now, if a crisis is about to strike, a natural disaster, crazy weather, something like that, close off nooks and crannies in your home where your cat or dog might try to escape and get them in the house as soon as you know trouble's on the way. The intermediate level of pet prepping builds on the beginner level, but also takes into account bug out situations and takes pet food storage a little more seriously. The medication and first aid supplies that you already stocked at the beginner level, you're going to put those in a pet specific tote container or a canvas bag, or maybe even a pet bug out bag. Your goal here is to have a grab and go container of some type that has everything you need for your pet's survival. Now, in addition to that first aid equipment, you're going to also stock copies of registration and vaccination certificates, cat litter and a tray, dog poop bags, food and water bowls, blankets if easily portable and necessary, any pet toys you might need, a leash, photograph of you with your pets in a sealed bag, Building your pet's bug out bag is one thing, but actually practicing the bug out is something else. And this is something that a lot of preppers fail to do. They build their bug out bag and they assume they're good to go without actually ever trying a bug out or using the gear inside their bug out bag. You want to avoid this mistake. You want to practice bug outs and you want your family to practice a bug out so everyone knows what to do. And if you're prepping for a pet, that includes your pet. You don't have to go out of your way to make a special bug out practice run either. You can couple a practice bug out trip with a trip to grandmother's house. I don't know. The, the point is to practice your bug out so that you, your loved ones, your family, and your pets are accustomed to all of a sudden we need to go. Everyone knows what to do. That reduces the odds of panic in the crisis, and there's no questions. Everyone's ready to act. Your pet should be accustomed to riding in whatever you plan to evacuate in, i.e. your bug-out vehicle. Plan multiple routes to your bug-out location and identify in advance hotels along the way that accept pets, assuming you might need to stay overnight somewhere. Make a list of boarding facilities and 24-hour veterinary clinics all along your different bug-out routes, just in case. I'm standing here in the kitchen because now I want to cover longer-term pet food preps. So this is going to involve mylar bags and oxygen absorbers, a process that is probably not that unfamiliar to many of you have, who have done long-term food storage. You start with picking the right dog food. So in this case, I've got two different types. This has a shelf life of one year. This has a shelf life of two years. The obvious difference here is likely preservatives, likely no preservatives. Choose the product that works for you. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to store these in this Mylar bag with the oxygen absorber and um, seal it up with an iron. I'll show you that process, but that is going to significantly extend the shelf life. Links in the description to all of these products. I'm also using this as an opportunity to film a video on storing green coffee beans. So if you are also a coffee drinker, then I'd suggest you check out that video as well. Why this method? Well, Mylar bags are perfect for sealing out air and blocking moisture and light. The combination of the oxygen absorber, sealing these inside, then removes the oxygen, preserving the integrity of the food that's stocked inside. So these two together are a great combo for long-term food storage. So this process is really easy. You set your, your clothes iron at its highest temperature, get out your dog food, and you need your oxygen absorbers. If you wanna spread these out, uh, throughout the bag, some on the bottom, some in the middle, some at the top. I generally just do overkill. You don't want to leave these open. Once you open them, you either want to use them or put them back sealed up so that they're not absorbing the oxygen or in the air around you. 
If you're really doing a ton of food and you want to measure these out exactly so that you can maximize your money spent for oxygen absorbers, you can just follow the link in the description that will take you to my website. And I've got a chart there that you can use to determine exactly how many oxygen absorbers you need in different sized bags for different foods. I'll take this food and dump some in. Roughly a third of the bag. Take some more oxygen absorbers. Throw those in. More food. These Mylar bags come in different sizes, so you can order what you need. I like to have a variety on hand. I'm not gonna save a couple of these, so again, I'm just gonna do overkill and spread these around inside the bag. Now you want to squeeze out as much air as you can. It's a little undersized, this bag, but we're gonna make do with it. There we go. And this will seal the mylar. And you're done, you're on to the next bag. I'm gonna label this with a magic marker, how much is here, type of food, and when I stocked it, the same as I did with these green coffee beans, three pounds uh, in October, 2020. If you've hung on until now, you're about to enter advanced level pet prepping. Congratulations and welcome to the Survive Doomsday Tribe. Make sure you've subscribed to the channel. Now this level of pet preparedness goes above and beyond just accumulating some extra food and supplies. You're gonna have to educate yourself or at a bare minimum, make sure that you've stocked the resources so that you know how to take care of your pet in a post-apocalyptic situation. Now you wanna buy a few EMP proof paperback books here, veterinary care books, so that you know how to take care of your pet's ailments in a post-apocalyptic world. There are a variety out there. I'd certainly recommend the military's veterinary care handbook for the war dog and the military's dog training handbook if you're training a dog for post-apocalyptic or defensive work. Links to both books in the description. In fact, any prepper that is training a dog for hunting, security, any sort of working dog like that, you really need to be at advanced level pet prepping. Reinforce basic obedience commands. In a chaotic world, a pet that listens and responds quickly to commands is safer. Train your pets to adapt to new environments. This might include getting used to different sounds, smells, and sights they might encounter in a post-collapse world. Invest time learning basic veterinary care, wound dressing, recognizing common illnesses, administering medication, and understanding dietary needs. Now, when it comes to pet food at this advanced level of pet prepping, you can stock mountains upon mountains of food and constantly be rotating stock, but that can get a little tedious and a little expensive. Fortunately, there is an alternative, which is food production in a post-collapse world, something that you can easily incorporate if you already have a farm or garden established. Now let's look more closely at this by going back into the past, because the post-apocalyptic future is going to be a lot like the past. Early Romans were feeding their farm dogs barley bread soaked in milk. They fed their war dogs raw meat. That was over 2,000 years ago. Fast forward to the Middle Ages. European royalty would treat their hunting dogs like royal family. Kennel cooks made large fats of dog stews containing grains, vegetables, and some meat. Commoners' dogs, on the other hand, were fed a more meager diet of breadcrumbs, raw bones, potatoes, and whatever the dog could hunt and find on its own. Live like a peasant, eat like a peasant. The modern era of pet food has really only been around since the 1850s when a savvy entrepreneur noticed sailors on the dock dumping spoiled hardtack over for the dogs to eat. This gave way to the first dog biscuit. In urban areas and cities where horses were being used, when those horses would die in the street, they'd be processed for dog food. The trends today are the raw food diet and the freeze-dried food diet. Conveniently, both of those are in line with post-collapse situations. The freeze-dried food, if you own a freeze dryer, perfect. You can do that on your own and the shelf life is gigantic. Raw food is also great in a post-collapse environment because there's no cooking and no fuel needed. But the unfortunate truth is that in a post-collapse, a post-SHTF, a post tiatwaki environment, a lot of us are going to be living like peasants if we're even fortunate to survive. That's going to mean our dogs, our cats are going to eat like peasants of old. Yes, you can raise chickens, you can raise rabbits, and you can 
mix in carrots and potatoes and create your own dog food. But if things are really bad, you're going to want to keep those foods for yourself and your family, your friends, your allies. That might not be your situation, however. You might live on a hobby farm where you have working dogs and their survival is paramount to your survival. You've got a situation there that is different than probably most pet owners. So you may want to account for those pets as your own family members. Now, what if the unthinkable happens? Some crisis strikes and for whatever reasons, you have to evacuate and you can't take your pets with you. Let's look at how to prep when you have to leave your pet behind. Your initial reaction might be, never, I'll never leave my pet behind. But never say never. We're planning for the unknown. A hurricane could strike and mittens has gone missing. Maybe you've solely planned for a bug-in situation, never expecting to have to bug out, particularly to a public shelter, but for whatever reason, you can't bug out, your home is unsafe, and you gotta go to the Superdome with everyone else. Pets aren't gonna be accepted there. The first course of action is to make sure you have a pet rescue alert sticker. This is really simple, they're really cheap, they're readily available. Make sure it's visible to rescue workers and that it includes the types and numbers of pets in your home as well as the name and number of your veterinarian. The second thing is to consider a GPS tracker. GPS trackers can be an invaluable tool for locating your pet and they're less expensive than you might think. They will allow you to track down your pet either before or after danger has passed. Another tip, assuming you have your pet with you at the time you need to evacuate and you can't take your pet with you for whatever reason is to have a designated pet caregiver. Maybe that's family, maybe that's friends, maybe that's people along your bug out route. Folks who you can trust with your pet if you can't take your pet with you. This person should be someone who is generally home during the day while you are at work and has easy access to your home. This may work well with neighbors who have pets of their own. You may even swap responsibilities. That way you have an agreed upon responsibility to one another. Here's another tip if you must leave your pet be home when flooding is a risk. Make sure the highest levels in your home are accessible to the pet. If that's a countertop, then make sure there's clean food and water on a countertop. If you have a second floor, make sure the doors are open on the second floor. If you have an attic, make sure the attic is open. The importance here is fairly obvious. As floodwaters rise, your pet is going to want to get higher and higher in the home. Now, hopefully you found some information here at least helpful in your pet preparedness plans. Maybe even one of these tips here is going to save your pet's life someday down the road. I'd appreciate a like. I'd appreciate a follow. See you in the next video.